Thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to be back down at uh, UCLA uh, to give a, a different talk. Uh, most of the, the talks that we give as scientists are scientific talks with a lot of data. I think I have one slide that has a graph. The rest of the stuff is going to be just things that I've learned over the years in terms of not only what you do as a pharmaceutical toxicologist, but how you get to be a pharmaceutical toxicologist. And so I call it a roadmap or whatever you want, but that's just depicts the, the journey that I took to get to having a position at various companies along the way. The latest being Amgen, I've been there for almost 14 years up in the Thousand Oaks campus, which is about an hour uh, to the north of here if you ever get a chance to go that way. Um, so let me just go ahead and let me introduce my colleague, uh, Lee Jin Fang. So Lee Jin is a more recent uh, uh, joining Amgen probably in the last, what, four years? Three years. So as you can see, she's much younger than me. So her perspective from having come from uh, uh, pharma uh, before down in San Diego and then before that was in graduate school at UCSD, right? So she just has a little bit more compressed perspective in terms of timing. So she might relate to you guys a little bit more than an old guy like me. So I will um, start by just giving you a little bit of my background. Oliver alluded to some of it there on that first slide. I've got, I think, 18 or 20 slides, so we won't have to stay in the room the whole time. But feel free to stop and start. If you think of something along the way that you have as a question, please stop me, because I'm happy to address those at that time. And then after that, going into you know insights into a career um, of how we do this, what we do when, along the way. And then kind of wrap it up by as you get to the end of your tenure as either a student or a postdoc and you're thinking about considering a career in industry, um, what are some of the, I would call them best practices for how to begin interfacing and to try to crack into that industry if that's indeed what you want to do? Because it, be, it can be fraught with some pitfalls and the bottom line is you have to be patient. So I got an undergraduate degree at a small school in Kansas City, I majored in biology. Uh, I then moved across the state of Missouri to St. Louis, took a PhD in 1995 in pharmacological and physiological science. It was during my time in the farm phys department that I became interested in toxicology. It turned out my graduate mentor, Dr. Mary Rue, was, uh, had just, and we, we I think as, as a discipline, had discovered this uh, receptor called the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. And at the time, back in the early days, we thought it might be a steroid receptor, and I was interested in steroid receptor biology. And then she said, well, we got this other receptor that might be like that, but it looks a little different. Might you start a project in that? And so to make a long story short, and that's how I think my career interests converged with Oliver's career interests um, all around the aerohydrocarbon receptor. And so I became interested in toxicology. As I was getting ready to graduate, I asked my uh, department chairman, Dr. Thomas Westfall, how do I do that? Because he, he was a pharmacology chairman. And he said, well, wait, we got this guy, Al Poklis, Alphonse Poklis. He's a forensic toxicologist. He came in once a year to give a lecture on forensic toxicology, which is like the toxicology that happens kind of after you're dead, right? So he would give a lecture on that. And so I asked him, where do I go to do a postdoc? And so he went over to, the, to the, uh, uh, Dr. Westfall's library, grabbed the copy of Kazaret and Duel, which was being edited by Curtis Clausen. And he said, call Kurt Clausen. I'm sure he'll have something for you. So long story short, I ended up for three years and did a postdoctoral fellowship in Kurt's lab, working on uh, gene expression regulation of some phase two drug metabolizing enzymes. So I stayed there for three years. And then um, I'll show you, I've, I've been a few other places in between. Uh, I took a, a board certification in general toxicology. It's, uh, DABT stands for the Diplomat of the American Board of Toxicology. It's an exam that you take um, to gain certification. I first became certified in 2003 and have recertified in uh, two years, two uh, different years since then. If you, if you do the math, you can tell that I'm due in 2018 for my uh, third recertification. So I'll be taking that exam coming up uh, this year sometime. And then when I was working uh, with Oliver and we had the course going, I was invited to be a, a visiting professor, um, something that was very, uh, very proud of that. And I got to sit on a dissertation committee for a student that um, has since graduated. And so that was kind of fun to listen to and, and see that progress of her project go through. So that you know, kind of gives you a sense for some of the educational highlights of, of where I've been. So this probably isn't new to you guys. This may be a slide for another audience, but 
why toxicology? Why did I end up in toxicology? Because my training was actually in physiology. Um, it ends up that, you know, it's a very integrated discipline. It draws on aspects of pharmacology, physiology, in order to understand what's happening to the organism. Understanding those fundamental biological pathways and processes is very important. And it also appeals to a large variety of training backgrounds. I have colleagues in toxicology who are chemists by training, um, who are pharmacologists. Um, and the other thing that you can get from a career in toxicology, and I'll just point this out on the screen, is you can really specialize. Um, you could, if you decide to choose a career in academics, you can obviously specialize in a very niche area for an entire career, um, exploring, for example, receptor biology, which is great. Uh, but in tox, you can go into things like neurotoxicity, which deals about toxicity in the brain and the central nervous system. Reproductive toxicity is all about um, understanding when you administer a drug to an organism that is pregnant, what happens to those offspring? Does the drug or does the toxin affect um, how many of the litter is born or are any of those uh, fetuses deformed? So you can study that. Genetic toxicology is a pretty classic discipline. This is one that talks about and understands the damage to DNA and chromosomes. Uh, there's some very classic assays like the Ames assay that are used in that particular discipline. Dermal toxicity is toxicity of the skin. The skin is one of the, one of the largest organs in the body and a point of entry for many toxicants, so it's very important to understand that. And then I have just very, uh, various other organ systems here, like the GI, cardiovascular, the liver. Um, here in your department, you're focused on techniques, molecular techniques to understand um, organ toxicities. And then there's things like in vitro tox, environmental, carcinogenicity. And then the other thing you can do is take your discipline and apply it. And so a lot of folks will become risk assessors. So they work for big companies and the company wants to understand if they have a commercial product that they're putting out and there's a chance that a child might ingest, say, um, you know, they have these, if you've ever seen these uh, uh, laundry detergent tablets they have now and they're kind of soft, squishy things and they're brightly colored and sometimes kids eat them. So someone would be wanting to do a risk assessment on how risky is it if someone ingests one of those things? And they would do that before they market the product. Other places like the FDA, you can consult. I mentioned forensic toxicology. There might have been a show on a few years ago, maybe it's still on, called CSI. You guys ever see that show? So, you know, the one thing about that show that always gets me is they don't wear their PPE. I mean, they're in the lab, <laughs> barely have lab coats on, never have glasses on. So, you know, if they ever ask me to consult to Hollywood, I'm going to say, hey guys, get your PPE on. Um, and the nice thing is, at least currently, there are plenty of jobs available in the various disciplines, whether it be in academia or in industry or some of the applied areas. So that, at least at the time, there were jobs available when I was looking as a PhD grad, you know, a, a postdoc getting ready to leave, it, leave and go into industry. There were positions available. Um, and I think that still holds true. And I'll, so there's some caveats behind that that I'll explain in the next few slides. <laughs> But then really coming back to the discipline. So you guys are learning all this stuff now and you're day in doubt exposed to these principles. And really your day job as a toxicologist on project teams is gonna be all about this stuff right here. So this is really the core of what you're learning, um, of what you're gonna, this is your toolbox. So thinking about things like the dose, how much of a drug or a toxin you're exposed to. As project team reps like Lee Jin is now and I have been, this is something you deal with almost on a daily basis. How much are we going to give to get the effect we want, the therapeutic effect? And then Lee Jin's going to ask, how much have I got to give to start showing some toxicity so that I can tell the clinic guys, okay, you want to look out for this organ, that organ. Um, here's, a, here's a clinical sign that might be something you want to look out for as we raise the dose. Uh, duration is, very, is something, again, very fundamentally important. So you can think about the drugs that we develop. So if you are a type 1 diabetic, you are going to be on insulin for the rest of your life. So that's an extensive duration. That drug has to be exceedingly safe, almost no side effects. I mean, it has side effects, obviously, metabolic side effects, but um, it doesn't cause DNA damage. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of other effects. So the duration is very important. Um, if you're developing a cancer therapy for people that have literally months or weeks to live, um, that duration may be short and that treatment may be very harsh, may be very toxic, but you're giving those people additional weeks and months of life. Um, so the, there's a risk-benefit ratio there that needs to be taken into account. 
Um, and, th and if you think about things that aren't drugs, like um, sunlight. So the reason people get skin cancer later in their life is because it's a cumulative dose of those ultraviolet radiation and that damage um, accrues. So the duration of exposure is important. Things like cigarette smoke. Usually you don't get cancer five years after you start smoking. It's you know, 40, 50 years after you smoke. So that's important to think about too. Uh, the, route, the route of exposure is not only important for folks like us who have to think about selling drugs, selling therapeutics. The most compliant route for people is taking it orally. You want to take a Tylenol, you want to take it by, uh, you know, take it with a glass of water. Probably the next best route would be an, uh, an injection like a vaccine, to get a vaccine injected in your arm. And then the third would be something like IV, which are generally more serious type therapies, like monoclonal antibodies or chemotherapeutics. Then going back to, you know, target organs, um, this is something that it's my job as a pharmaceutical toxicologist to identify what the target organs are so that I can tell the clinical guys as they're bringing a new medicine into people for the first time, here's what you want to watch out for. This drug may have a propensity to cause liver enzyme elevations and so, so they'll put those tests on the study. Um, this drug may cause body temperature to go down. This drug may cause uh, people to become agitated. Um, it may cause them to um, experience nausea. So these are all the kinds of things that we can inform the clinic early on based on this early work. Uh, to better enable them to take care of those volunteers in those early, early studies. Then thinking about species, are you a susceptible species? We are required by law, before we put a drug on the market, to test, to test it in two non-clinical species, usually a rodent and a non-rodent. So one example would be you test it in a rat, and maybe your second species is a non-human primate. So that you think about that, though, you, you run the risk, though, what if the rat is overly sensitive what if the monkey is overly sensitive to this? So you're going you're gonna to basically be over predicting that toxicity in human. We could be very resistant to that. And so we may start the clinical trial at a dose that's so low, it's going to take forever for us to find out how it works. The bigger risk is if your non-clinical species are under susceptible or, not, or more tolerant to the drug, then you go into humans and you're surprised. And so that's, that's the kind of thing that, um, we don't want to see. So we'd, we'd rather overpredict than underpredict, but both are possible when you're working with um, non-human non species. How often does that happen? When you have a two-species model, how often does that happen that you get that, yeah. uh, that super sensitivity in human? Yeah, it's a great question. So we, we, with two species, the general rule of thumb is we're, pre, we're appropriately predictive 75 to 80 percent of the time. So the remaining 15 to 20 percent of the time, you could be surprised. But you know, the, the, we're going to go in very conservatively. And so rarely are you going to put a, a, a patient in jeopardy on the first dose. Likely, you may, hit, you may hit start seeing those toxicities earlier than you expected based on your preclinical data. So your safety margin, say you have a safety margin of 100, and suddenly after a few doses, you find out it's 30. Um, pretty rare situation for that, but that's kind of what we would. So we build in safety factors to make sure that we don't put someone at risk. Um, so we hedge our bets a little bit. It just makes the trials go on longer because you have to dose up and then wait, dose up and then wait. And then thinking about the type of toxicity, acute or chronic, again, maybe more, uh, some more examples around that are things like you know, if you were exposed to something like cyanide, that's an acute toxicity, um, immediately life-threatening uh, versus chronic. Some chronic toxicities are things like sunlight exposure, cigarette smoke, things like that that are much more uh, chronic in nature that are going to take weeks to months to years to, to manifest into something that actually makes you go get, go get help. And think about potency. So what we want to do as we design drugs is to make the most potent drugs that we can because that means we give the smallest dose. And generally, what, for a small molecule, so for a pill, we want to be aiming for 10 milligrams or less. And you think about drugs that are 10 milligrams or less, very few of those drugs have side effects that are something we would really worry about. So like benzodiazepines, Valium, those types of drugs are usually given in one, milli you know, one milligram doses, half milligram doses, very tiny doses, and they don't have that many side effects, maybe just some drowsiness. So thinking about that. Detoxification, this is very important. Um, we need to know as the body then deals with the drug, how, do, how does that drug get eliminated? And so normally I would have a pharmacokinetics colleague here who could tell me, you know, how is this poison? I say poison, this could be drug. Um, 
remember Paracelsus, the difference between a poison and a, and a remedy is the dose. And so um, can that be rendered non-toxic? So what are the excretion mechanisms? So with Tylenol, you know, if you take too much of it, first you overwhelm glutathione, then you, well, first you overwhelm the sulfotransferases, then you overwhelm glutathione, and then you start having liver toxicity. Fortunately, for something like Tylenol, there is a, a, a compound that can be administered that's actually a remedy um, that will rescue that toxicity. And this one here, save the best for last, you know, is the toxicity reversible or irreversible? So we always, of course, want to develop a drug. And if we do see a toxicity, we want to have it be reversible. But I've actually been on project teams where we saw irreversible toxicity in a non-clinical species. And that was the end of the program. That was it. So that particular toxicity, which we have published on, was for a, uh, a disease indication, uh, an Alzheimer's disease indication. And what we saw in a 28-day study was retinal degeneration. So anything generally in the brain or the CNS where you see an effect, it's not going to be reversible. And once you start decreasing the cell layers in the retina, that's a one-way street. And so you're, the, the animals could end up blind. And translating that to thinking humans would be susceptible as well, that was a risk that we just weren't willing to take. And so the, the program was um, stopped at that point. And they went back and looked for new chemistry to try to get away from that effect. So again, and going back to the reason why I bring this slide here, none of you should be surprised about this, but really these basic principles are the, you know, this is the bread and butter of your daily job. Um, all these things here, if you're sitting on a project team. So I think this is my only data slide, and this was taken from a salary survey that is put out by the SOT. I think they do it every, every three years. This one's dated back to 2007, so it's probably a little bit different, but it doesn't change a lot, especially in this particular set of categories. So most of the folks in our field tend to take the terminal degree. Most of them are doctoral students. There are a few people who train in tox programs that get master's degrees, and a smaller number who have bachelor's degrees. And I have, in my staff at Amgen, people from all three uh, of these fields. And then where do these people come from? Some of them come from bona fide toxicology programs. Some, like me, come from physiology backgrounds. And the rest kind of trickle down from chemistry, biochemistry, pathology. A few folks have medical degrees. Some of them have uh, veterinary degrees. And so you can see a kind of a spread there. But by and large, most of them are, are captured in the, first, in the first three. Not surprisingly, those are life sciences or toxicology based. Does everybody have a DABT? No. So the, so the DABT is, is, again, a board certificate. So how that works is um, once a year, there is an exam that takes place. I think it takes place in three, three regions in the world, maybe four now. So there's one in San Jose, California. There's one in Research Triangle Park. There's one in India. And I think there may be one in China. If there isn't, there'll be one soon. And so what it is is a 300-question exam. Um, the first day, you take the, the first section and the second section. Then you go to sleep. And then you come back the next morning, you take the third section. And you have to pass all three in order to get certified. So I was fortunate enough I passed on the first time. Some of my colleagues sitting next to me didn't. I had to come back next year to pick up the one they missed. Um, and so it covers several different disciplines within toxicology from agents and actions to you know, very specific cases of, you know, say a, a dog comes into a veterinary emergency room presenting with these symptoms, what's the most likely poison kind of thing. So it's, it's pretty, you know, it's, it's fun to learn it, and it's, but it's pretty intense. I mean, there's a pretty crazy few months of study ahead of that that you have to really kind of, especially for me, I'm kind of focused on, at the time I was focused on, you know, pharmaceutical in vitro toxicology. I didn't know very much about environmental poisons and things that cows can eat that'll make them sick. Um, and all that stuff's in there, so. Is there any um, legal requirement to have the DABT for any particular No, no, there's no, so it's not like a, you know, like for example, uh, certain, I'm sure certain physicians have to be board certified in order to do a particular role. I mean, I'm not gonna get arrested if I don't have it. I might get arrested if I do it badly, right? So, but no, there's no sort of uh, legal kind of ramifications of that. It's just, it's kind of a nice to have because it means, it means you sat that exam and w with your colleagues and passed it and recertified. So I, I tried to assemble a, a little table here of where we end up as toxicologists. Not surprisingly, there's quite a few 
of my colleagues, your colleagues who are in academic institutions. I've just put a few here. I guess since I first became exposed to toxicology at the University of Kansas, I put that one first, but there's, that's, there's no reason, to re reason why UCLA wouldn't be first. It probably just depends on who makes the slides. Uh, but all these um, universities um, do have some offering in, in toxicology. Um, other people tend to you know, prefer working in the government, which is perfectly fine, EPA, FDA, uh, the NIHS, and NTP down in North Carolina. And then a variety of industry opportunities that I highlight on the bottom here across a number of different sectors. And so I put pharmaceutical up here first. And just to give you an idea, if you don't know who the companies are, places like where I work, Amgen. Genentech is located up in San Francisco. Uh, Allergan is located just down the road in Irvine. Pfizer is located in multiple sites. The closest one, I believe, is in La Jolla, California, down in San Diego. Uh, Johnson & Johnson, primarily East Coast, but they do have a site in La Jolla. AbbVie, which used to be called Abbott Labs, uh, they changed their name, um, have sites um, around the world. The most notable ones are in Chicago. The most notable one is in Chicago. They have one actually down in Temecula that does some cardiovascular research. GSK is GlaxoSmithKline. It's, that's an amalgamation of a European and a US company. And they have sites in Pennsylvania and in North Carolina, I believe. AstraZeneca is also primarily uh, European. But they do have, I, th I think they still have a site in the US. <coughs> Roche, which partly owns, or owns, owns Genentech. But the interesting thing about the Roche-Genentech relationship is they, Roche leaves Genentech alone. So Genentech has their own, you know, they develop their own drugs. Um, Roche owns them, um, but Roche is a completely Swiss company. They've, Roche used to have sites in the U.S., but they've moved everything back to Switzerland. Um, and so the only U.S. site now that Roche is affiliated with is Genentech in, in San Francisco. And, the, you know, this, this story changes probably on a every two-year basis. So I used to work for a company called Pharmacia. It's now part of Pfizer. There used to be a company called um, Wyeth. They're part of Pfizer. Uh, Pfizer is really good at acquiring companies and absorbing them in. Um, and that's, what they've, that's kind of been their business model for the last about 10 years. Um, consumer products, I mentioned that a little bit. So Procter & Gamble, they're the people that make the, the, they make Tide, things like Tide. They make diapers. They make a million different things. Uh, but the one example with the Tide Pods would be the case where you do a risk assessment to make sure the kids don't want to eat those things. Unilever, uh, Johnson & Johnson. John, j and is interesting because they not only have a consumer products division, but they also have a pharma division. Then there's things like Petroleum, Exxon, British Petroleum, risk assessment companies. There's a lot of consultants out there. Um, and then finally, contract laboratories like Charles River and Covance. And so contract laboratories for someone that's really wanting to get into industry is a really good place to go cut your teeth. You're going to learn more probably in four years at a contract lab than you're going to learn in a decade at Amgen. Because you're doing toxicology studies, in vivo studies, every day of the week, 365 days of the year. I mean, obviously you get vacation when you get vacation, but that, these are really good training grounds and they're generally more apt to take people that are less experienced in their career. So it's a really good training ground. Does Amgen use those companies, or does it do everything in house? Um, we are the opposite. So we do every, almost all of our in vivo work is done through contractors outside. And it just simply comes down to cost. The, the cost to run a vivarium and to keep a vivarium secure are extremely expensive. And so we just we have the studies performed at these CROs. So you, but you do the in vitro. Yeah, so I would, you know, so the early in vitro screening, well, we would we rely on contractors for that, too. So, like, we do a, a GPC, a G protein coupled receptor panel. We do that in France at Sarep. They screen a, you know, a few dozen receptors for us just to make sure we're not hitting those as off-target effects. A company called Sarep, they're based in France. So there's all the, you know, so we do some work in-house. We probably contract out, I would say, 60% of of the science these days, and it's done in China, it's done in India, it's done in Europe, it's done really all over all over the world. A, really, kind of a global model, and we're not the only ones that do that. But do you design the protocol? It depends on the study. So, for the in vivo studies, the IND enabling the studies where you're going to, you know, be dosing animals, we design those studies. We design them, 
and they execute the studies. We, send them, we make the test article, we make the drug, we send it to the lab. They formulate it, they dose it, and then they do all the work after that, you know, day, you know, dose it every day. At the end, they take the tissues, do all the pathology, all the endpoints, compile that into a study report that's four or 500 pages long, and then they send it back to us and we go, okay, can we go ahead? Do we have a safety margin or not? So to, to have a comprehensive course in this would probably take a week because you could, I could spend an entire four hour lecture on a 28 day enable, IND enabling study because it's just, there's so many intricate little pieces to that study and how we would get it going. But if, if everything is outsourced like this, does that mean that the, the number of people working at Amgen in itself is, is small because most of the work is done outside? Yeah, so we don't need to. We don't need to. We don't need to have you know technical staff that are dosing animals um, day and night. So most of the stuff. So when I'm at, when I was doing this kind of work uh, as a project team rep, you know, I didn't. I, I didn't even didn't even need to go into a vivarium. I would just design the study, get it. You know, vet it through my you know my colleagues. We have pretty rigorous internal you know standards for making sure the studies are robust. And then we would award that study to one of the contract labs, and they would run it on a, you know very specific timelines and, and metrics and all that. So you're right; we don't we don't need as many people. I get, you know I always get the question about well I'm I'm worried about if I go to industry, my name's going to disappear from the marquee lights, and I'm here to say that that's not true. At least the group that we work in, my executive, actually our vice president Cindy Afshari, is very keen on making sure that we do publish and we continue to publish. And so this was a nice piece of work that was done actually by my postdoc, this guy Tom Long. Pretty interesting setup here. So what we did for this particular project is we hired Tom as an Amgen full-time full equivalent. So he's an Amgen employee. Uh, we sent him to our site in Cambridge, Massachusetts. But he did all the work in the laboratory of Linda Griffith. So Linda Griffith is a world-renowned um, bioengineering uh, liver on a chip scientist and she said well, that would be great let's get Tom in here because he'll bring pharma perspective to our liver chip bioreactor and actually maybe have a project around a, a true problem that, that we're facing in industry see the engineers build these great platforms but they don't necessarily know the how to apply them to kind of real life scenarios and so, so that's what Tom did with this project and actually it made the December cover of drug metabolism and disposition what this is is a liver bioreactor and that what happens is there's these little scaffolds inside this look, looks like a 96 well plate setup and the media will flow through so these are the hepatocytes surrounding these little um, discs and then these blank spaces in the middle are where the media is going to flow through either this way or that way and so we carried these cells out for 14 days and they were able to demonstrate a drug drug interaction between a large and small molecule so uh, the citation there is, is is there and that's our I think that's our most our most recent publication we did have another uh, gentleman in our group who did a project with decode genetics decode is a company based in Iceland that we own and so they're very powerful in understanding genetic contributions to um, health and so Paul it turns out discovered a gene that makes people actually less susceptible to heart heart disease and heart attacks and he wrote that up with his colleagues, the, our colleagues from Decode, and actually made the New England Journal of Medicine. So that was a pretty fantastic piece of work that we're now trying to take that target and convert it into the next blockbuster cardiovascular drug. So we do get to publish, um, and sometimes even in high impact journals. So just to give you a sense for where do toxicologists end up, um, this map might be a little bit dated, and I'll show you where some of the differences are, but. Not surprisingly, based on what I said, there's quite a few people located in North Carolina, a lot in California. New Jersey always puts up big numbers. Maryland and Pennsylvania are the top probably five states. Um, the, the number, these numbers don't match because these are toxicologists by state, and then this is SOT membership by region. So they don't quite match up, but um, the point gets across that in the Northeast, you've got you know over 13, 1,400 people that work in this um, that are SOT members. The Mid-Atlantic, the Southeast, a little bit less. And then more out in the Southwest, fewer kind of in this area here. And one of the things we've seen is that in the past, 
probably 10 years, one of the major things that happened in Michigan is that Pfizer basically drove all their research out of Michigan and, and went somewhere else. And so the, the North Central numbers is probably actually less now than it, than it was back then. It was around 1,000, it may be half that now. So as companies consolidate and move and shift around, these numbers will change a little, but in particular, the take home message is most of us end up here in industry. Some of us end up here. Some of us end up in a little town up here called Seattle. Um, but other than that, and in North Carolina with the EPA and NIHS and NTP, quite a few people end up down there. And the rest is kind of hit and miss. And that'll be important as I talk about career, which is coming up next. So this is my post-academic career. So after I left Kurt's lab, I took a job at a very small company that was based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So this is one of these moments in your career when I was getting ready to get the itch to leave. I'd been there three years, published some stuff, and was ready to go. And Kurt was very supportive of me looking and opened up, I think it was Science or Nature, and there was a small little ad right in the middle. And it read like every line of my CV, perfectly matched up. And I go, well, this is the place. Um, and then I said, Santa Fe, I didn't know anything about Santa Fe, but it sounded cool. So I looked it up. This is the early days of the internet. And it's like, wow, it really looks cool. I want to go there. So ended up going there. I think I was person number 13. So it really was a small rodeo environment. We you know, had some venture funding. And we were uh, doing very early gene expression using gene chips. Um, and so this was the first time someone had actually applied that to toxicological problems. And so it was kind of a neat thing. Um, at the peak of operations, they got up to about 60 people. And um, when I left there in 2002, they had shrunk down a bit, but they were still going along. Unfortunately, they're, they're no longer uh, around today. I left uh, phase one in 2002, and I moved to Michigan uh, at Pharmacia, which was characterized as a large pharma. They had about 40,000 staff worldwide. They were based in, again, in there were some in St. Louis, Kalamazoo, New Jersey, and in Sweden, there was a group there. Um, and then a few months after I came, uh, Pfizer purchased the company, and some of us became ir irrelevant or non, became redundant to their future business and left. And so I joined Amgen at that time in 2003, and I've been out here ever since. Just to give you a sense for if you don't know about Amgen, it's a large biotech pharma company. 15, I'm guessing probably now more on the order of 20,000 people worldwide. There's about 7,000 in Thousand Oaks. Uh, Thousand Oaks is the headquarters, so it's the biggest site. And it's actually, I mean, Oliver, you know, it's kind of like a college campus. It's got dozens of buildings and a really nice kind of, it feels very much like being, um, being, you know, even here at UCLA, I think just the demographic's a little bit older than some of what I see walking around here on campus at UCLA. Um, but we do have other R&D centers outside Thousand Oaks, namely South San Francisco. This site's growing, growing extensively now. Cambridge, Mass is another site where we're growing, growing um, the business there. Have a small site in British Columbia, a site in, in Germany, and a new site in Shanghai, China. The reason we're in Shanghai is because Amgen's interested in eventually accessing the Chinese population because it's so huge, and there's a lot of unmet medical need there, particularly for cancer and oncology. But the only way that you can get a drug into a Chinese person is to have research and development taking place in China. So we had to invest in um, that site and that facility. And they've been going now for about four years. So one of the things that's nice, I'll go back one slide just for a second. One of the things that's nice, you can see I started here in 2003. And it's now 2017. So there's been about 14 years that have passed. I have. Uh, I have about a three to four year attention span, as you can see from, from this. So what I did at Amgen, because it's a big company, is I did different stuff. So when I first got there, I was head of the in vitro toxicology lab. So I did that for about four years. I supervised and hired a team of scientists for some in vitro assays. We did gene tox screening. We did HERG. HERG, as you know, is an early screen for cardiovascular risk. We did a bunch of cell-based assays for various reasons and then brought in some automation. Um, because as you alluded to, it's much easier to um, let a robot do something than it is to let a person do something. And so we uh, invested heavily in those automated platforms. So after that, an opportunity came up. And I, uh, I'm going the wrong way. 
I became a project team representative uh, for about three and a half or four years. That's what Lee Jin is today. So she's a project team representative. And so what this person does, you are the lead toxicologist for drug discovery teams. And so these teams are made up of chemists, biologists, uh, pharmacokineticists, uh, guys that work on formulation, pharmaceutics people, toxicology. We usually have a project manager. And that job entails, you know, looking at the target, understanding what happens if we drug that target? Is something going to happen to the individual if we inhibit that target? We design and we oversee these early in vivo tox studies. When I say oversee, they're run at those CROs. So we oversee that and make sure they're done right. Um, typically, what we're doing in this stage is looking at early stage 4 and 14 day rat studies. So really early tox studies to get a read on, is this molecule even viable to move forward? And most of them drop out in, at this stage. And then we do some other studies at dose escalation in um, non-rodent species, and these can be up to 14 days in length. And we used to, when I was doing this, we used to do this in-house. We shifted um, all this activity now to being outside, uh, just because it enabled us to do more stuff um, with our partners and keep our headcount at a manageable level. And then probably the most important part of this job is running these are what's called IND enabling studies. So an IND is an investigational new drug. That means I'm going to take this molecule. I think it's going to work as a therapeutic. But in order to get into people, I need to do two 28-day studies, one in a rat and one in either a non-human primate or a dog. These are repeat dose studies run to GLP standards. So this is not a GLP lecture, but GLP stands for good laboratory practice. Um, government mandated rules for how these studies are run and how they're controlled. So it's basically extensive documentation of everything that goes on. Uh, a safety pharmacology battery. This is around, safety pharmacology concerns anything that's immediately life threatening. So anything in the CNS, the respiratory, uh, nervous system, cardiovascular. So anything that's going to create a situation where um, it could be a life threatening, we want to make sure we understand what that looks like. And then, of course, we run the GLP gene tox just to make sure that the compounds we're administering don't cause damage to DNA or mutate or break chromosomes. And then the final thing we do is once this is done, we author the key, in sec key sections of the IND. In Britain, it's called an IMPD. And then we submit that to the agency. They have 30 days to decide if we can go into humans. Um, and so that's probably the most important part of, of that job. The agency in the US being the FDA. FDA, yeah. On to part three of the Amgen experience. So it's kind of like a movie with three parts, but just not nearly as exciting. Um, so now I was, I'm currently the head of the, what we call the Cell Signaling and Safety Biology Group. I've been doing that for about the last five or six years. Um, and this was a, a chance to really uh, do, do some managerial work. I supervised up to 15 scientists. I had some folks that worked for me. When we had a site in Seattle, I had a, had a guy in Cambridge, as I mentioned and working on predictive safety assays. So we do, as I mentioned, some off-target profiling. Because we want to make sure our drugs are specific, hitting a specific target. Supporting issue resolution studies. When, as we're doing this development process, not everything goes according to plan. And so sometimes we have to resolve issues. And that's for very specialized assays. I just named a few here, a Leydig cell assay, a mast cell assay, uh, things like histamine release. And then I was able to participate in the buildup of our labs in Shanghai. I never got to go, but um, I, was, I was here telling them what they needed to buy, the type of people they needed to recruit, and then the types of assays they needed to build up. So I talk about location. Um, sometimes if you're from Southern California, if you spend a lot of time in Southern California, you think Southern California is the only place to live. But really, if you want to kind of expand your opportunities and become available to where those other jobs might exist, you're going to have to think about moving around. And so this is just where my little map has taken me. And so as I mentioned, I started here in camp, well, actually, I started here in a little tiny town in western South Dakota called Deadwood. That's where I was born. So I'm the pro only person that you're going to meet today and probably this week or this month from Deadwood, South Dakota. So anyway, that's going way back, way, way back. So eventually wound up in Kansas City and did my undergraduate, graduate school in St. Louis back to Kansas City for my postdoc. Moved out to New Mexico with that biotech startup. Moved to Kalamazoo, Michigan for the work at Pharmacia. Moved to Amgen back in 2003. And then I have question marks for the rest of, you know, 
having been at Amgen 14 years, maybe it's an interesting time to think about doing something different. So where that will take me next, you who knows? You don't want to leave the Southwest quickly. Well, yeah, it's, it, it, would be, it would be hard to leave the Southwest, I have to say. I've become quite accustomed to the nice weather and the sunshine. I mean, being from South Dakota, you know, I, I know what snow looks like. I don't want to shovel it anymore. It's a good place to visit in the summer. So again, just to kind of wrap it up here uh, with a, a few slides to take home. I know we have to probably get out of the room here pretty quick, but there's many ways to kind of get into the industry. There are some postdocs available in industry, not too many. Amgen does have a postdoctoral program. Um, we just started it, I think, last year. So there is a way in through that. I would argue that entry into industry directly out of graduate school, especially in tox and safety, is comparatively rare. But I mentioned the opportunities at contract labs, so those are a little bit easier to get into. Uh, you can specialize in all kinds of areas. If you like cardiovascular, you can do that. If you like um, liver tox, you can do that. You can adapt your career. As I showed at Amgen, I've done three different things. Regional opportunities, so keep your Keep your mind open to things on the, in the Northeast, the East Coast, and the West Coast. And if you're willing to do that, you'll have more things at your disposal. And the, probably the most important thing, and I'll show this as we, I lead into the next slide, is your professional network is probably going to be your most valuable asset. So use every opportunity to build that network up and keep it viable. Um, you have it easy these days. Back in the old days, we had business cards and telephone calls, and you'd go to a meeting and talk to someone in person. Now we've got things like LinkedIn and texting and Instagram and all that fancy stuff. And you know, it's easier, I think, these days to, to build up a, a pretty solid network of people like, at, at those things. But really no substitute for the face-to-face -face meetings. And I would encourage you to keep in contact with those people, your most influential colleagues, a couple times a year. Just check in with them. I talk to Kurt Clausen a couple times a year just to see how he's doing. Um, I talk to my colleagues in pharma a couple times a year. You know, even if I'm just sending them a joke and I was, hey, what's going on? Then we start into a conversation about how things are going. And then I pulled this out of a book that um, was published a few years ago by this guy, Spencer Johnson. He's a medical doctor and does some of these kind of self-help-ish kind of things. And one of the lines in the book is, never put your running shoes away. And I'm a runner, so I never do put them away. Or if I, I do, I don't put them away very long. But I think that the thing here is that, you know, things are going to change over time. And so you have to be ready to adapt. And so. He's got these six or so things, change happens, anticipate it, monitor it, adapt, move, enjoy. Um, and living in the industry world, that certainly is the case. I, rarely a year goes by when there isn't some significant change in the business that affects my day job. So then applying for industry jobs, this is kind of what I want to leave you guys with. I'm not sure what slide I'm on here, but yeah, it's pretty close to the end. Um, again, your professional network is your most powerful ally. So. You may see a very interesting job at Amgen, but you may know not one person at Amgen. But a colleague of yours knows, oh, I know Bob Dunn at Amgen. And then if I get introduced to you, then I can say, hey, to the hiring manager, yeah, this person might be, I met them at UCLA, they have a good professor, done some good work, published in some key journals. So that referral is going to carry a lot of weight with the hiring manager, especially if they don't know you. So if I call a good buddy of mine at Roche and say, hey, this person's pretty good, they're going to take that seriously. Um, a lot of people start at company career websites, um, so these are, you know, unfortunately these are pretty frustrating uh, in, my, in my experience. I would say they're useful to get an idea of the jobs that are available, the types of jobs, but really it's a black hole. Your name goes in and I'm sure some of you have done this and you never hear a thing. Well, it's just, you know, people will go through those and they'll triage and it doesn't, if you don't have the right three things, buzzwords on your thing, if you didn't go to UCLA or whatever, they just, without even having a conversation. So it's kind of a, it's not the best way to do it, which is why this first one's probably the most important. The only other thing I would say, is don't, don't be discouraged from applying, apply, but only apply to the jobs you're qualified for. I have to, can't tell you how many times at Amgen I've seen a person that's applied to my job and 60 other jobs, and you know, I call it carpet bombing. What, do you, what message is that sending to you? You basically want anything. And it's not really the good way to go about it, is you need to go in and say, I want this. This is specifically what I'm interested in. It's what I'm most qualified to do. Someone that wants to be a toxicologist probably shouldn't be applying for a job in a research TA in neuroscience, especially if they don't know anything about neuroscience. So you know, if you're going to apply for it, be very selective, because once you're kind of known as a carpet bomber, your, your stock with HR goes way down. And the final thing is just be patient. Um, these things take time. Months usually is the 
latency. Rarely are you going to go in for an interview on Monday and know that on Friday you're hired. Um, I think I've had a situation once in my career where I interviewed. At the end of the day, I asked the hiring manager, have you made a decision? He said, yes, I made a decision. Two weeks later, I found out it was me. But that was probably, that was like unicorn rare, so that doesn't happen very often. But when you, if you do get an interview, one of your most important questions is ask him how soon do you expect feedback? What is your decision timeline? Because the last thing you want to do is go home, and then your wife or your husband is asking you, well, did you get a job? Well, I don't know. Well, when are you going to find out? Well, I don't know. I didn't ask. And so believe me, keep peace at home. Make sure you know when to expect feedback. Personal experience. Then once you get to the point where you've succeeded in, in obtaining an interview, you ha absolutely have to do your homework. So you go and you research that company, its portfolio. You need to know them inside and out. Every drug they've ever launched, are they in licensing? Are they out licensing? What areas are they strong in? Are they oncology, diabetes? Uh, have a very specific answer to why do you want to work for us? Um, and again, back to the company, I can't tell you how many people I've interviewed. I said, why, why do you want to work at Amgen? And they say, because it's a good biotech company. That's not the good answer. I, I want to know, well, yeah, I know, I'm, I know it's a good biotech company. Tell me, tell me something else. Like, what, you know, name a drug that we have. And they, sometimes you just don't get any response. So they clearly haven't done their homework. So that's something that I would emphasize everybody. And also, if you're, you're likely going to be asked to give a presentation, especially as a scientist. So ask the hiring manager what kind of